in uh, human IPS lines. Uh, this is so that we could accelerate the drug discovery. And uh, these are biobank uh, based on different medical history, ethnicity, sex, and we also use the isogenic lines. And the lines are also linked to EPIC, which is the medical system that we use. And so we know all the clinical information of these uh, patients. We routinely perform multi-omics uh, sequencing on these uh, IPS uh, derivatives and so that we can understand how the human genetic uh, variations uh, impact the drug response. And we also work with FDA on drug safety testing and also with NIH on uh, resource sharing plan. In fact, we've given out probably about 4,000 vials of these IPS cells to more than uh, 500 investigators in the U.S. and abroad. And so in terms of deciding uh, whether you want to work with 2D uh, versus uh, 3D uh, IPS uh, cells uh, or derivatives, uh, here I put down two uh, review articles that we've uh, uh, written in which um, we highlight some of the advantages and drawbacks of uh, working with 2D versus 3D. And so, for example, shown here on the left is very simple. With 2D, uh, you're going to have increased throughput uh, but decreased maturation. And with uh, 3D, you're going to have increased tissue maturity and decreased uh, throughput. So that's a very simple concept. And also with uh, 3, uh, 3D, uh, there's a lot of areas of research in which uh, some of you in this audience here may consider uh, working on. For example, how do you uh, vascularize uh, the uh, organoids or microphysiological system? Uh, how do you um, enhance the genetic background and also minimize the cell line variability? Uh, what is the impact of the extracellular matrix uh, composition and mechanics? And also, this is an important area of investigation. If you can come up with some type of universal multi-cell type media, this will be a significant advance in the field. And I list some other uh, topics as shown here. And so uh, using this as an example, I just want to highlight uh, one particular variant we've been working on. This is the uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase as genetic polymorphism. I picked this for this uh, crowd right here. We, we actually work on many, many different mutations, but I picked this one because about 36% of us in this room uh, do not have or are missing this uh, enzyme activity, uh, including myself. So if I drink alcohol, I have facial flushing, I have nausea, uh, tachycardia, and headache. In fact, my heart rate will shoot up to about 140s uh, just with a half a glass of uh, uh, alcohol. We treat the alcoholics by giving them disulfiram, and so disulfiram works on the same mechanism by blocking the enzyme. So what happens is when you drink alcohol, alcohol becomes acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is toxic. Acetaldehyde gets broken down to acetic acid, which is non-toxic by uh, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. So if you're missing this enzyme, you have a much higher buildup of the toxic uh, acetaldehyde. And so uh, this uh, enzyme deficiency has been linked to increased coronary artery disease, more severe outcome after uh, heart attack, hypertension, uh, type 2 diabetes, and so forth. And so this is no joke. Uh, this is, uh, these are epidemiology studies observed in Japanese men, Korean men, and also Han Chinese, uh, including myself uh, here. And so about uh, 10 years ago, one of my former postdocs, who's now a faculty in Germany, uh, Antje Eber, uh, decided to look at what is the impact of this uh, genetic uh, variant on uh, myocardial infarction, and how do you model that? So we recruited Stanford undergrads, and these are five undergrads who could uh, drink. Another one is five undergrads who have East Asian descent, but heterozygous, uh, which means they will have similar symptoms as I do. Uh, we generate the iPSL uh, uh, derived cardiomyocytes. We expose it to hypoxia. And you can see here, and this is a lot of work summarized in one slide. You can see here that uh, the wild type uh, patients, when you give them the same amount of hypoxia, they tolerated uh, the hypoxia quite well with lower apoptosis compared to the heterozygous uh, patient right here. So what's happening is that this enzyme is not only involved in detoxifying alcohol, it's also involved in detoxifying reactive oxygen species. And so if you have a heart attack, you get tons of ROS that gets activated, and you have a harder time getting rid of the, uh, the ROS if you are missing this enzyme, and hence perhaps explaining for a uh, worse outcome after a myocardial infarction. Now, this is using a uh, iPSL-derived cardiomyocyte model. 
Uh, subsequently, uh, Hang Chao Guo, who's now uh, actually a uh, Chinese postdoc, who's now a assistant professor in University of Utah, uh, he followed up the study with, uh, in this case, differentiating iPS cell uh, cut, uh, into endothelial cell. And he's trying to understand what is the effect of alcohol and uh, vascular uh, dysfunction. And so based on the uh, Japan Biobank data, we know that patients uh, with this uh, enzyme deficiency have much more vascular uh, dysfunction. And you could do CRISPR genome editing to confirm this uh, by taking patients with this enzyme deficiency and correcting it, or by taking normal patient adding this uh, enzyme uh, deficiency. And again, to make a very long story short, uh, we did molecular docking uh, analysis. And we came out with the HIT. Uh, this is an embaglifosome. This is an uh, FDA approved for SGLT2 inhibitors. And we showed the mechanism here of how uh, an embaglifosome can be used to mitigate vascular dysfunction due to uh, alcohol. And a lot more information are contained in this uh, paper here. And so my personal opinion is that if you're drinking, try to drink less. And if you're not drinking, uh, do not drink because, in my opinion, there's zero benefit of uh, cardiovascular health uh, uh, from uh, alcohol uh, drinking. And so I show you one example of how we can use iPS cells to study, for example, yeast agents with aldehyde dehydrogenase. We have several projects in our lab in which we are studying uh, African Americans with hypertension, uh, Hispanics with uh, diabetic vasculopathy, uh, South Asians with uh, metabolic uh, syndrome. And so I want to shift uh, to the second part of my talk, which is then how we use this uh, technology for drug screening and drug uh, development. And this slide here shows the difficulty of developing a drug. Uh, essentially, it'll take you about 10, 12, 15 years to develop a drug from R&D, uh, research and development stage, to a clinical improvement. Costs a lot of money, about, you know, on average, one to two billion dollars. And this is the reason why the drugs are very expensive, because the companies that fail on previous drugs need to recuperate some of the costs that back. And so we've been, um, uh, for the past uh, several years, we've been systematically uh, doing uh, what we call creating an encyclopedia drug transcriptomic uh, signatures. And so shown here, I just highlighted two papers. One is on the left, which is a calcium channel blockers, nifedipine, amlodipine, diotiazin, and verapamil. These are very common calcium channel blockers that's tested on uh, engineered heart tissues. And we just look at the response of uh, engineered heart tissues among different individuals uh, to the calcium channel blockers. And on the right are uh, HMG CoA reductase inhibitors, and essentially statins, uh, atovastatin, lovastatin, simvastatin, and fluvastatin. And you'll see on the figure there, there are four people. We generated IPA cell cardiomyocytes, treated them with four different kinds of statins. And there's a lot of data there, but I just want to summarize by saying that even within the same individual, how we respond to these uh, four different drugs would be quite different from one individual to another individual. Again, testing to the fact there's uh, a lot of uh, individual heterogeneity, how we respond to uh, drugs. Uh, this is a follow-up study with the statin uh, story in which uh, this work was done by Chang Lu, also a Chinese uh, postdoc. Uh, and uh, he's now a, an assistant professor at the Medical College of uh, Wisconsin. In this case here, uh, he did a very comprehensive uh, study to s understand how statin improved uh, endothelial uh, dis uh, dysfunction. Because for clinicians, um, we give statins to patients and we only check the cholesterol. So I've always wondered for the longest time, what is the effect of statin on our vascular uh, uh, health? And here uh, he worked out on a cartoon uh, D right here, the entire mechanism of how we think statin can improve uh, vascular health, essentially working through the EAP TED uh, pathways and the epigenetic uh, modification uh, there. Uh, but again, the full story, you're welcome to uh, take a look. Um, and so I think the uh, combining the iPS cells and stem cells, uh, you'll see more and more applications of this. And this is mainly due to the uh, advances in the AI machine learning area. I think there's uh, a lot of talks uh, earlier this morning about you know, how we're using AI machine learning to look at echo images, look at MRI images. Here, we use it uh, for uh, drug discovery. When I was a uh, PhD student, I did my PhD in pharmacology. We pipette the drugs one by one, and we test the effect. Right now, uh, if you give me, if I know the structure of the protein, um, as long as I know the structure of the protein, I can feed it into our software, 
and we could screen for about a billion compounds at a time. And based on these uh, uh, screening, we can narrow down to a reasonable number of uh, drugs. We can work with our chemists to further narrow it down, and then we can then work with uh, drug companies, for example, Wuxi here in China, to help synthesize the drug so that we can then take the drug and test it on our iPS cells. Uh, so shown here, uh, this is in collaboration with our startup company, uh, scientists at Greenstone uh, Biosciences. You'll see on the bottom right, uh, it's a protein structure. The three drugs who we're interested in, and the molecular docking already tells you that the drug in pink sticks uh, to the uh, protein that we want. So therefore, we'll pursue the drug in pink, and we will not pursue the drug in uh, blue and drug in uh, light uh, uh, blue. And so I just want to show you, this is one example of what uh, we've done using these molecular docking uh, experiments. And this is uh, based, uh, this is a, uh, a study done by Thomas Wei, who's now a assistant professor at NTU, and then Mark Chandy, who's now an assistant professor in Canada, in which we look at uh, cannabinoid receptor one. Uh, essentially, uh, in the U.S., uh, marijuana is now legal in about 35 states, and what most people don't know is actually marijuana causes a vascular inflammation. And we know this because when we query the U.K. Biobank database, we know if you do an association study, if you enter marijuana, enter uh, myocardial infarction, you'll see a higher association. So we want to understand the mechanism. And so it turns out within marijuana, they, the principal psychedelic active component is THC, uh, delta 9 THC. Delta 9 THC binds to the cannabinoid 1 receptor. By binding to the CB1 receptor, it causes a downstream activation of the MAP kinase uh, pathways. And by using iPSL and the DDO cells, you could show that it causes a whole bunch of inflammatory cascades. We then put the CB1 receptor into our software, and we're querying for drugs that can actually block uh, the CB1. And so in this case here, uh, many drugs that came out as a hit, and then we further pursue uh, genestin. Genestin is a isoflavonone. Uh, it's found in soybean derivative. It's a neutral CB1 antagonist. Essentially, it binds to the receptor. It doesn't activate the pathway, but it prevents a TSC from binding uh, to the receptor. And so here we could show that by adding genestin, it can cut down the inflammation. By adding genestin in two different um, Mouse models of atherosclerosis and can also cut down the uh, inflammation as well. So we actually have additional studies um, on this uh, genescent uh, product that I you know, hope to present in future uh, meetings. And so you will see more and more examples of people using large populations of uh, these uh, iPS cells and uh, pool them together get some kind of drug and understand what is the effect of uh, the uh, drugs and then as long as you know the DNA sequencing, uh, you know the patient's RNA sequencing, you can actually work out what we call the EQTL. And this is an example of a project that we were doing with FDA in which uh, it's 200 patients. And we generate the iPS cells. We pull them together and uh, 20 cells at a batch. And then we give increasing dose of uh, doxorubicin. Uh, and then uh, we do the single cell RNA sequencing. And then based on this right here, we can actually sort out which dot belongs to which patient and what is the genetic susceptibility of each one of the patients in terms of whether they're high risk or low risk uh, for uh, doxorubicin induced cardiotoxicity. So I want to move key, uh, to the last part of my talk, which is using uh, this approach for clinical trials in a dish. So in theory, you should be able to take patients, uh, for example, anybody in this room, generate your cells test your drugs and see which one of us respond and which one of us that does not respond, and then give us the drugs that respond. And so this is something that my lab's been working on for the past uh, uh, 10 years or so. And as I mentioned earlier uh, today, uh, the FDA and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency are going to adopt uh, these alternative uh, uh, methods for drug uh, testing uh, moving uh, forward. And this, I also showed this uh, slide here. Essentially, this is what my lab does. So we use uh, predictive AI, generative AI. And uh, right now, we are focusing mostly on small molecules. But other labs are here. For example, you guys can be working on vaccines or ASOs or antibodies. And then doesn't matter what drug product you're working on, you probably need to validate it in your in vitro drug screening assay. You also need to validate it in your in vivo uh, studies for your PKPD. 
once you confirm uh, the hits uh, before you move to a clinical trial, you probably want to put, you know, test it on a panel of say, you know, 200, 300 patients, either the iPS cell, cardiomyocytes, or organoids, or microphysiological systems, depending on what your area of uh, interest or expertise is. And so I just want to show you one example of how we've been able to do this uh, quote unquote clinical trial in a dish. And this is a uh, large family that we uh, recruited maybe about six years ago in which um, it's actually a Chinese family uh, in the Bay Area and also across the, uh, the US and nine of them died from sudden cardiac death. And it turns out that they have a lamin frame shift mutation. Lamin is involved in the nuclear membrane. And so if you're missing this lamin, the nuclear structure gets screwed up and the cells are much more fragile. And it causes, in this case here, caused uh, cardiomyopathy as well as uh, atrial fibrillation and also some, some uh, cardiac death in many of these uh, patients. And so on the cartoon on the right, you'll see that this is the mechanism of how uh, lamin causes uh, uh, the dilated uh, cardiomyopathy. And uh, I'm short of time, but I just want to show you how we did a drug library screen and we came out with the hit uh, quinonolib. Quinonolib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. At low dose, it blocks the PDGF, uh, abnormal PDGF activation. However, I cannot give quinonolib uh, to the uh, patients because it's still not FDA approved. It's still under phase two, phase three trials. So we stop here and we rather we shifted and pivoted to uh, the fact that many of these patients that we saw uh, actually have early onset hypertension, meaning that at age 30s and age 40s, they have high blood pressure. So we're scratching our head and say, well, besides the cardiomyopathy, why is it they also have high blood pressure? And so we differentiated the iPS cell into endothelial cells, and we compared the endothelial cells between the lamin patient versus the normal patient. And we saw some differences, and one of the differences is the KLF2 uh, pathways. And so that's a target we want to go after. We did a screen for KLF2 uh, pathway drugs that can activate it, and uh, lovastatin came out as a hit. And then the cartoon on the right basically shows how lovastatin uh, improves at the mechanism in vitro. So now comes the second part, which is we want to test this uh, in humans. So we actually ask the patients to come back, uh, and we give them uh, lovastatin, even though they don't have high cholesterol. And we measure their, what we call a, a vascular uh, response using an endopat. And so you'll see here the normal endopat numbers, uh, reactive hyperemia index is 1.67 and above. These are very young individuals. And this one, for example, lab patient number two had 0.48. So young individual, the only thing they have is a lamin mutation, very poor uh, vascular dysfunction, normal cholesterol. We give them uh, lovastatin because it's already an FDA approved drug. And after six months, you can see the improvement of the vascular uh, dysfunction right here. So this is easier for us to implement because this is already an FDA approved uh, drug. And so this is an example of a clinical trial uh, in a dish in which you have the patients, you work out the uh, exact mechanisms, and you came out with drug hit, and then you test your drugs on your iPS cells, and then you give it back to the same patient. I show you an example of FDA approved drug, but you could use this for uh, new drugs, except that it's going to take you longer to develop. Um, and so uh, this slide here essentially summarizes what my lab does. So we do a lot of uh, patient iPS cells to understand disease mechanisms. Uh, we do a lot of sequencing uh, so that we can convert the biological specimen into digital data. Biological specimen is your iPS cell. Digital data is your, uh, is your RNA sequencing, metabolomics, proteomics. You feed them into the AI machine learning uh, software so that we're interested in turning on new drugs. And then you test your drugs at, uh, on, again, not on mouse, not on immortalized cell line, but on iPS cells that have the exact dis the disease that you're working on. And so I just want to acknowledge uh, the postdocs in my lab and their funding uh, support right here. And also the instructors are here. Many of them are looking for faculty positions. Uh, and then my former postdocs are here and my collaborators at Stanford, outside of Stanford and funding support. And this is my email if you have any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.